All right, let me ask you this really quick. Just a little participation up front, okay? I won't do this for the whole half hour, I promise. But just a little up front. Is anyone else tired of hearing bad news? Is it just me or is it anyone else? Yeah, okay, okay. I get, yeah, got hands over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Others of us were like, oh, no, I could, I could use some more bad news, actually. Uh, no, listen, it's just, you know, on the news, right? Social media, you know, from your friends, folks are upset. People are hurting and angry about this thing or that thing. And, and it just kind of struck me this morning, I'm sorry, this week, as I was studying in Galatians 2, I'm just like, man, like you kind of get bombarded with bad news kind of over and over and over, or, or you hear it over and over and over, and it just, it just gets kind of old, and, and it does wear you down, and, and your soul can only take so much. But uh, church, I don't mean this in a cheesy way. I mean this in a very sincere way, in a joyful way, but I got good news for you today. I have, I have, I have the best news for you today, that you are loved by the creator of the universe, or who knows the multiverse if you are so inclined. Nonetheless, you are loved by the God who's in charge of all of it, who made all of it. He's a good God who wants to know you, who wants to free you. Yeah, sure, free you from your sin, free you from your struggles, and ultimately the prisons of our own making. That's good news, right church? Come on, that's good news. Well, last week we introduced ourselves to the book of Galatians. And the big idea is that God gave us Jesus. That is the the good news right there, his death, burial, and resurrection. But how our very real enemy desires and wants to counterfeit and corrupt such good news. The author of this letter to the churches in Galatia, what we call the book of Galatians, the author is a man named Paul. And he wrote this letter to the churches in that region called Galatia, and he wrote it mainly defending the gospel against some counterfeits. If you were with us last week, you will already know this, but here's the kind of the refresher. Uh, Back then, a couple thousand years ago, some false teachers showed up and they were teaching, if you really want to be saved, right? If you really want to go to heaven one day, Jesus is great but you also must be circumcised. If you wanna get to heaven, that's what you need to do. And while we had a couple of good jokes and laughs about that last week, uh, the reality is that we are still tempted to do things in similar manner, where maybe it's not Jesus plus you know, uh, circumcision, but it's Jesus plus maybe my preferred interpretation of revelation. It's Jesus plus my ideology, it's Jesus plus my politics, whatever, you know? Um, And the heart of, of, of Galatians and where we landed last week was that if you add anything to Jesus, if it's Jesus plus anything, it ruins everything. Instead, we land on Jesus plus nothing is our salvation. Jesus is simple. Jesus lived, he loved, He died, he rose again, he took on your sin, and you are forgiven in Jesus. You are freed from your sin through Jesus. That's good news, that's great news, that's the gospel. And so after the short intro that we walked through in those first 10 verses, here we are, verse 11. Go ahead and and go there with me right now. You'll see it on the screens. Paul moves us forward. Verse 11, for... I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. We'll pause right there for a moment. The good news didn't come from secular society, Paul is saying. It didn't come from philosophers or politicians. It didn't come from beautiful Instagram posts. The good news doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from man, but it comes down to us from the throne of King Jesus. And that means there is hope for this world. There is healing for this world. There is love to be found in this world. But that hope and healing and love, it it does not come from the wisdom of you and I, but it comes from God through Jesus. 
Are we there? We good? So far, so, so far, so good. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, and, and when it comes to things made by mankind, when we produce things, uh, they're, they're usually flawed. And I was reminded of that this week as I was thinking back on my experiences with man-made things. Something that comes from mankind is poorly designed cars. I, and I tell you, I've had a, f- a few lemons in my day, but I'll tell you this really quick. I've been driving for 20 years, legally for 18, but in my time, again, I've, I've, I've had a few lemons in my day that always needed you know, some work or, or things were always just not going right. And I had this one that I was really proud of because I didn't take my dad with me already a recipe for disaster, honestly, but I was proud of myself and you know, had a couple thousand dollars and, I, I, and I, I felt like I made a good investment and I kept taking this car in over and over. It was always something engine related. Um, I am not a mechanic, so I'll just leave it there. It was something engine related all the time, over and over. It was like six, seven months, over and over and over. And I keep taking it to the same mechanic who I uh, went to church with at the time. And so we finally had this conversation And he tells me this. He says, this car specifically has design flaws within the engine. You'll be fixing this as long as you know it. And I was kind of spunky at 19. And I said, it'd be nice if you told me this three visits ago, but okay, thanks, man. But that's the thing about man-made things. Man-made things, no matter how good they are, they will eventually fail unless you're our heating and cooling system. It's going on 80 years now, it's still going. But but one day, one day against my will, it will fail. And some fail, they, they just fail at a higher rate than others, right? But what comes from man, what comes from man will eventually fall short. That's, that's my idea here, okay? What comes from us, what comes from human ingenuity, human uh, thinking and rational, it'll always fall short eventually. And Paul is telling these Galatians, the gospel is perfect. No updates, no tweaks, no upgrades, no changes are needed. God got it right the first time. But he's writing this because, again, these false teachers, they, they show up and, and they start adding and, and in their minds upgrading or updating. We talked about that last week. I won't get back into it. Um, but these false teachers are exactly that. They're, they're just false. They're, they're wrong. And then, as Paul moves through his letter, he tells us a little about his past. Go to verse 13. Look at this. Paul writes, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. So Paul says, you may have heard about my past. You might know some religious zealots, but they've got nothing on who I used to be. If you don't know, Paul used to have a different name entirely. That's how much he's changed as he was Saul. And so Saul, he was an extremist. And Saul is saying, listen, I hated Christians. I wanted to destroy them. And I was praised for doing it. My community had my back. They said, you're so good at this. Go do it more. And that's how good he was at persecuting Christians. And so Saul, he was this, honestly, let's let's be real. He was a zealous terrorist. There's really no way around that. And And who did he do it for? He says it right there in the text. He says he did it for his fathers, right? Or you could understand that. He did it for the sake of his tradition. He did it for the sake of tradition. And we talked about that a little bit last week when we were talking about how sometimes we are tempted, right, to add to Jesus, Jesus plus, right? And sometimes we're tempted to take Jesus and add our tradition and then call it the gospel, right? Well, you know, growing up, this is how we were always supposed to, you know, dress. Well, growing up, this is how we were always supposed to do it this way. Growing up, you know, right? We're we're tempted to add our tradition to Jesus. 
that's not how that should work. Or others of us, there are things that, you know, come up in culture that you want to kind of make more palatable, right? So it's Jesus plus something that's a cultural hot topic that I'm not going to touch this morning, but you know, just those things can be difficult though, right? That's what, that's, that's my point. It gets difficult sometimes because we're all tempted to do these sorts of things. And, and it can just be dangerous to add to Jesus. And so for Saul, he's so tied up in this tradition and Saul's life revolved around his traditions and it fueled his hatred until, look at verse 15, un, until this, verse 15, Paul says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. Pause really quick. Paul goes from living for his traditions, fathers, to living for God the Father. Paul believes that before he was even born, that, that God set him apart, that God wanted Paul, but not for religious means to persecute Christians, but for the purpose of grace. And in his grace, God showed Paul, who again was then Saul, that this grace, it comes through Jesus. It's all Jesus. It's only Jesus. That's what we're all about here at Rock Vineyard Church. This is all on Jesus. So what did Paul do? Again, Paul is recapping in a way what happened to him. You can read more details in the book of Acts if you're interested. But for our purposes, move forward with me. Verse 16, it continues. Paul goes on to say, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. You ever like have a moment where like, like something changes in your life and you're like, I need to be by myself for a little bit, y'all. I don't know if Jesus you know, showed up on your road, but I think I would need a moment as well, okay? And Paul is, is, you know, just saying like, hey, I, you know what? I didn't actually venture out to go to those apostles immediately. I needed some time. And so Paul is saying when he encountered Jesus on that road, he just needed time. And I, I had to resolve everything I, I dedicated my life to previously. This is what Paul is thinking. I had, to, I, I had to reconsider everything. He lived decades in this tradition, but he experienced this newfound grace. And sometimes that's exactly what Jesus does because he upends everything we thought we knew and, and the ways that we were taught, how we were raised. And it's so life-changing sometimes. And you know people like this. Maybe you are a person like this. You're like a totally different person. It's like Saul to Paul. It, it, for, for Paul, it changes so much that he cannot recognize who he used to be. He doesn't even know who that was anymore. Because for Paul specifically, but also, hey, listen, this is just applicable to us. You cannot hate people and claim to follow Jesus. I'll say it again. You can't hate people and claim to follow Jesus. You cannot slander and harm others without conviction and follow Jesus. You, you simply can't hurt people in the name of Jesus. And even at this point, moment of, of conversion, Paul understands that. Oh, Saul. Saul understands that. And this life changing, uh, this life changing, this, this affects everything in his life. This isn't just a changed belief of mind. You know, like, have you ever been convinced to change your mind about something, right? You know, it's just a change of mind, but this goes beyond the mind. This is a new heart, a new life. You pass from death into life. And if I could, that is the difference in redemption and religion. That's the difference in Jesus redeeming us and religion. Let's talk about this for a moment. See, here's, here's where I want to start with this idea of redemption versus religion. See, with, with redemption, the focus is Jesus. With religion, the focus is me. Okay, so there's Jesus' work, there's Jesus' life, there's Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, there's Jesus' love for me, there's Jesus' love for his enemies, there is Jesus' love for my enemies, or me. 
I'll take Jesus. I'm not going to lie. I'll do that. I'll take him every time. Because I don't want to live a life or, or leave a legacy that was solely focused on myself. I want to focus my attention and my affection on the King of Kings who loves me, who loves you, who, who saves us. And that's redemption. That's beautiful. That, that redemption, it takes our mistakes, our, our sins, and our collective history, and it turns that mess into a message of redemption. Jesus, he takes your sin and he redeems it. He takes your shame and your guilt and he redeems it. Jesus takes your hatred and he redeems it. Are you awake this morning? He redeems all of it. Religion, though, it amplifies all of that. And it makes it all about me and my performance. Did I do enough today? Did I sin too much today? Did I pray enough, give enough? Did I perform well enough for God? Man, religion stinks. And, and that's how you know if you're experiencing redemption or if you're simply acting out a religious script, the focus is either Jesus or it's me. Redemption brings us to Jesus and that is our focus now think of it this way, the difference, again, in redemption and religion. Uh, what about works? Well, there's Jesus' work, and then there's my work. When it comes to redemption and religion, uh, works do matter. You can quote me on it, okay? Works do matter, but it's whose work that matters. I know, some of you, you're like, uh-oh, no. It's whose work that matters. There's Jesus' finished work versus my performative hollow rituals meant to try to curry favor. Jesus finished work on the cross and his resurrection versus my feeble attempts to maybe do enough good to think I could earn heaven. Again, Paul was trying to show the Galatians, your works don't work. They're like a car Pastor Kevin buys when he's a teenager. They don't work, okay? And again, in, in their case, in this case, circumcision, it, it doesn't do what you think it does. But church, your works don't matter like that either. You don't earn it. You never could. It's a gift given by God's grace. And that's the difference in works that are redeemed versus works of religion, now, don't hear me say you shouldn't pray, you shouldn't read, you, you know, you shouldn't do it. No, it's just all about the motive of these things. That's what this comes down to, okay? And this is all about Jesus' work, not my work, not your work. Uh, another thing is what is produced. What comes from my faith? There's humility, and I believe there is arrogance. What is produced? Because if my focus is Jesus, if the work belongs to Jesus, then it means Jesus gets the glory and the credit, not me. I believe redemption makes you humble because you now look at your life through a telescope of grace. Get that in your mind for a moment. A telescope of grace, seeing your history and, and realizing, man, I was a really messed up person before Jesus. I was cruel. I was manipulative. I was selfish and hateful, even evil at times. But when the past is redeemed by the grace of Jesus, when it is redeemed, it doesn't change what you did, like it's all now fine and good, but it's a reminder of what life was like before Christ. And honestly, it makes you humble. It kind of puts you in a place where it's a little more difficult to judge other people because you know where you've come from. Redemption produces humility. Now, you will be imperfect, of course. You're going to stumble into arrogance, of course. We're, we're people. We're flawed. But what is your faith ultimately guiding you in? What's produced of, from your faith? Humility or arrogance? Because religion doesn't come with a telescope of grace. I think religion comes with a magnifying glass of arrogance where we examine the lives of other people what they're doing, what they're not doing, what, what I'm doing and how well I'm doing it, but how other people are falling 
short, examining the lives and sins of other people and conveniently forgetting our own. Religion, it makes you proud and arrogant. And honestly, why, why wouldn't it? Religion has a way of showing you how you saved you, which is an oxymoron. You don't save you, but you know that's, that's what religion tells you. Hey, through your effort, through your intelligence, through your work, through your charisma and your cunning, you earn, and that's just not true. And some of us may be believers and, and followers of Jesus, but maybe we still have some religious areas in our lives where maybe internally we kind of lord it over others. If I'm being really honest, I think some of us, we are so desperate, so desperately in need of full redemption that extinguishes our arrogance in every area and our, our need to be right, our need to feel a certain way, and that this redemption would humble us. Not because God is, is angry and ready to, you know, pound you into the ground or anything like that, but because that's a man-made bondage that we suffer through and we suffer with, that we make this all about ourselves and our achievements. And so in that, it's all about our works again, and that just leads us further into arrogance. But a faith that produces humility, I think that's a faith that reflects the redemption of Christ. Uh, lastly, in this little bit here, I think there's a byproduct. And, and I do think that's different than what you actively produce. Okay, there's what you produce actively, humility or arrogance. But then there's the overall byproduct of this. It makes you new or it makes you worse. And, and the byproduct of redemption, again, it's this larger picture. And the byproduct of redemption is that you are made new day by day, moment by moment. Your focus is Jesus. The work is Jesus' work. You produce humility, and as a byproduct, you are actively made new. Now, if you contrast that with, with religion, where the focus is me, and the works are mine, and I produce arrogance, and as a byproduct, it makes me way worse. Paul, as he's writing Galatians, he knows this very, very well because he has lived the life of the proud, arrogant, religious persecutor. But he experienced redemption and everything changed. Paul goes off to be alone for a time. He has some guests visit. You can read again in Acts about it. But he begins to be taught a bit more about Jesus. Look what he says in verse 18. Uh, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. That's another name they had for Peter, the Peter, okay? He went to visit Peter and, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. I love that he felt the need to say that because, listen, there's always doubters. It's fine, you know. But people are like, I don't know, man. I think you're still Saul, you know. And he's like, listen, God is my witness. I am not lying about this, okay. And then he's like, it, you know, kind of like how, you know, like when you feel like maybe you're trying to justify yourself, you're kind of reaching for things. And he's like, listen, I, I was hanging out with Cephas. And if that's not enough, I was also with Jesus' little brother, James. Like, like I'm not lying, y'all. And, and really he's saying like, listen, I was horrible. Saul was or horrible. And I won't shy away from who I used to be, but somehow in God's grace, he saw fit to save me. And so I go visit Peter. Jesus' little brother was there. Hand on the Bible. I'm not lying to you. Verse 21. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So Paul's conversion, it is really coming full circle at this point, okay? As his old life was arrogant, his new life is humble. His old life was evil, his new life is gracious. His old ways were hateful and murderous, but his new life is loving and peaceful. And this conversion is famous. 
absolutely famous. Uh, I think I was maybe, uh, I grew up in church. I grew up in a great Baptist church growing up. And I think around 14, 15 years old, I, I started thinking like, if this whole religion thing's real, like it's gonna change the way I live. And if it's not, it also will change the way I live. And so I kind of started like thinking about it more and more and more. And as the years like went on, I kept like reading different testimonies of different missionaries, you know, who did different things. And it was cool and inspiring. But I'm not gonna lie, sometimes you just hear one story and you really resonate with it, right? And one story I heard some time ago, uh, it's, it's a little more of a modern, war, uh, modern one than Saul to Paul, um, but one of my personal favorites is a man. Uh, his name is uh, Brian Head Welch. And uh, if you are not familiar uh, with the music of Korn, uh, consider what the Chicago Tribune called the rap metal band. Uh, he, was, he was a guitarist for this band, Korn, and uh, the Chicago Tribune called them perverts, psychopaths, paramaniacs. They had songs called Freak on a Leash uh, and, and Make Me Bad. They have lyrics that are sexually explicit, very dark. So you can imagine the shock of the fans of the band Korn when they released this statement, this was 2005. They said, we're parting ways with our longtime guitarist, Brian Head Welch. They said, Brian has chosen the Lord Jesus Christ as his savior and will be dedicating his musical pursuits to that end. Just like Saul, people were suspicious. I don't know, man, what if this is all just to mock Christians? What if this is all just a big thing? What if this, if it's a publicity stunt, what if this, what if that? So that week, Welch showed up to a church, Valley Bible Fellowship, and to a crowd of thousands, pe uh, thousands of people. He said, I'm the happiest man in the world right now. And I bring this up because, and it makes me emotional because it's a really beautiful story. Um, but I bring this up because just last month in January, he posted this photo on Instagram. And I'll read the quick caption to you. Uh, Brian wrote this. He said, happy spiritual birthday to me. This picture was the number one downloaded photo on Yahoo. The day, I mean, that already dates this so much, but you know, it, it was though, it was the number one downloaded photo on Yahoo that day. Probably because of the ridicule that I brought on myself a metal guitarist getting baptized in Israel, resembling the popular white American image of Jesus Christ, LOL. People thought it was a practical joke, but what happened on the inside of me was no joke at all. And it is just as powerful and secure today, 19 years later. Coming to the end of myself was so precious because it helped me come to a profound realization. I truly despise myself. I was depressed and addicted and my view of life was just to die. Laying my life down in the Jordan River waters in Israel symbolized that death to self. And he finishes the caption with this. New life will never be birthed until a death happens. I'll say that one more time. New life will never be birthed until a death happens. A laying down of one's pride, an egotistical mindset. I wanna thank you all for being on this journey with me and having my back. Whether you are on a similar spiritual journey or not, I respect and appreciate you all. Uh, Welch, is a reoccurring guest on various Christian networks and was recently sharing in an interview how Jesus breaks chains of addiction, sin, and self-hatred. In church, the tagline of our series for Galatians is breaking chains and finding freedom. And if you don't wanna take my word for it, listen to someone who grew up outside of faith achieved every dream you could ever want to only come to the end of himself 
and ultimately surrender his life to Jesus. And this isn't in my notes. I just need to say this really quick. Um, I, I just get really excited about this. Um, he said what did it though, what, what really put him on that path was that he was buying a house and his, and his real estate agent, his real estate agent said, Brian, I don't wanna be weird. You know, when a Christian says that, you never know what's about to happen. And he said, I just wanna share a verse with you. And it was, it, was, it was the words of Jesus, come to me all who are weary, I will give you rest. And, and for, for Brian, he said he went uh, into a hotel room for days and, and started uh, coming off of all the drugs he was on and, and everything. And it's just a powerful reminder uh, to not ignore those little things. Even right now, as, as you sit here and you think like, man, that's such a great story. And I'm like, yeah, right? Like, isn't, isn't that incredible? Like, someone like that can be a Christian. And, and, and that it be real and profound. And, and it starts with the smallest thing. And so whether you are a murderous persecutor of Christians like Saul or a metalhead addict like Brian Welch, or you are somewhere in between, this gospel of grace is always for you. It is always open to you. It is for all people in all situations at all times. And if you are a Christian, then you know this is true of yourself. Christian, do not forget how far you've come. You may be here this morning and you're thinking, I just feel out of sync. I feel dry. I feel like I'm not close to God. It's not really vibrant right now. Do not forget how far you have come. I, I, I plead with you, do not forget what God has done in your life and in your heart, what he has brought you through. And so the season might be difficult, but he has still trusted you with so much. You have a history you may not be proud of, but God takes that story, what you could call a tested story, and he redeems it. Not so we can brag about ourselves or talk about how far we've come and pulled ourselves up because that's religious, right? But so that we can boast about a good God that still delivers and still heals and still works here and now, because guess what? He still loves you finishing up right now. I just want to ask some, some questions today as, as we wrap up. Just a couple of questions. What are you holding on to this morning that God desires to free you of? What is it maybe that you're hiding as a secret chain that you hope no one else will notice? Maybe you're so consumed by what others might think of you that you don't see how you are being consumed by it yourself. What could God do in your life if you would put down your religion, you know, your works and, and arrogance and your worse self, and you embraced a grace that truly frees you of all of that? Here is how Galatians 1 wraps up. Paul says this, verse 22. Paul says, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Before Paul was well known for this, word was getting around that a former persecutor of Christians was now preaching Jesus. And what happened? Were people afraid? Maybe a little bit. Initially, were they upset that a murderous persecutor could be redeemed? Did they, did they petition to God? That's not fair. No, he wrote it himself. They glorified God. And Paul uses this phrase, because of me, meaning because of who I used to be. That's how far God has brought me. Church, there is power in your testimony. Almost 2,000 years ago, a man named John wrote this, but he was looking ahead. Uh, and, and John was a, was a friend of Jesus, and he wrote this in his revelation. John uh, wrote Revelation 12, 11. 
he wrote, and they have conquered him. That's Satan. They've conquered him by the blood of the lamb, and that is Jesus, and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives, even unto death. Meaning they didn't make it about themselves, even till the day they died. This was always about someone else. And this life is about someone else. Band, will you join me up here? I'm going to, a couple of closing remarks. I'm going to get out of the way here. Um, Church, to stick with me just just another minute or two, okay? Uh, First, uh, to the Christians who are with us today, uh, if I could just talk to you for for, for a second. Uh, Christians, if you say, I follow Jesus, I'm I'm, I'm a part of it. There is power in your testimony, in your tested story, okay? There's power in your testimony. Who needs to hear your testimony this week? Do you have children who need to hear maybe an age-appropriate aspect of your testimony? Do you have a neighbor that you want to invite to church, but you don't want to make it weird? I mean, what if you got into a conversation and maybe you put on humility and you shared an area of your life or something from your past that simply connects with them. People are impressed by your strengths, but people connect with your weaknesses. I can't encourage you enough. Share your story with someone this week. I officially challenge you to do it. You you don't know what can come from it. You don't know what God can do with it, even if it's something as simple sharing a Bible verse with someone who is far from God. Uh, Second, uh, to those who do not believe. I was talking to those Christians. And and now if you're here and you're kind of in the margins or you're just unsure or you're just like, I don't even know why I'm here this morning. Uh, Well, one, I'm glad you're here. Uh, But two, uh, Jesus' grace, his life-changing grace, it is greater than any high, any drink, any stroke of your own ego. Uh, Jesus' grace, it it frees us from the chains that that bind us to hell on earth. In hell, that is the separation of God after we die. Jesus breaks chains, he finds the lost, and he loves you too much to watch you suffer another day. You can come to him, all who are weary, because he will give you rest. Rest.